died. I had decided that I was just going to lay down next to his grave, and it was cold enough I'd freeze to death. I went, laid down on the grave next to it, and then all of a sudden, he and I heard him say, you need to get up. And I remember look, looking over at the grave and thinking, okay, this is working. I'm starting to hallucinate. And then the next thing I heard, I said, get up and get out of there. This is Touched by Heaven, everyday encounters with God. Those moments when heaven and earth collide and we see God, we see his hand reaching out to us, attempting to get our attention, inviting us into a closer relationship. Here we share stories of encounter with angels, divine intervention, prophetic dreams, visions, near-death experiences, big and little God incidents. I'm your host, Trapper Jack. Welcome. This will be episode 175. Glad you're here for this remarkable story of Patrick Kenny. This is, this is like a boxing match, and Patrick just keeps getting knocked down and getting back up again. How does he do it? Well, the help of Dad, uh, both of them actually. You know, I'm reminded of Psalm 54. God himself is my help. God himself is my helper. And that is the case here because down goes Patrick again. There's, there's, I mean, he loses his dad. There's health issues with his son, knocked down. He, health issues with his wife, he's knocked down. And he keeps getting back up again with the help of God. Now, Pat talks about a lot of these events. He is a speaker out there, so he doesn't, he doesn't need much help from Trapper in this episode. So I'm going to be sitting back along with you and listening to these remarkable stories of getting knocked down and God himself, being my helper, helping Pat back up again. This story comes out of the Chicago area where Pat was a fire chief for many, many years. Uh, if you want to go back to Ireland, that's where mom and dad are from. Not that they met there. They were living 15 miles from each other and didn't meet there. They had to meet in Chicago at a dance. That's where it all begins. I mean, everything about this story has that Irish feel all around it. You know, Patrick Kenny. Can you get more Irish than that, Patrick? There were three pictures that hung in the living room. There was a picture of the Pope. There was a picture of John F. Kennedy. And there was a picture of the original Mayor Daley. And you never said a negative word about any of them in terms of what the belief was, the values, the um, values. I can still remember one time screwing around in church when I was a little kid with my mom. I got up to leave. She's like, no, you need to sit down. And I'm like, why? She goes, because we're staying for the 10. I'm like, what do, we, what do you mean we're staying for the 10? She said, well, if you couldn't behave for the 830, you got nothing out of it. So you can stay for the 10. We stayed for the 10. I sat there like a saint. I got up to leave. She goes, no, I think we're staying for the 12. So she made me sit through the entire day. I never again fooled around during mass. Oh my, um, that's serious. So yeah. That's oh, big serious. Time. Yeah. Wow. And my dad, the thing that I remember vividly about him was at night, if you walked past his bedroom door and the door was open, here's this big hulk of a guy in his boxer shorts on his knees saying his prayers every night. I had a picture of the blessed Virgin over the, over the bed and he, every night. And there was, he wasn't, he would humble himself before that because he felt that that's what he needed to do. Wow. So those are kind of the visuals, um, that I grew up with. And so, yeah, absolutely. Faith was, was a huge part of my growing up. I've heard more than one dad also say that, uh, it's not a bad thing to kind of leave the door open. And when you get down on your knees to make sure when your kids do walk by to see that, cause it does create an impression, doesn't it? Oh my, oh my goodness. Seriously. I, that's probably one of the first five or six memories Okay, so when do you fade away, though? Everybody fades away. You faded, so, yes? So my, my struggle began, uh, I was in a really bad car accident before I started my freshman year of high school. I, I got hit by a car and ended up with both my legs shattered. And uh, I, would, I was going to high school to play football and baseball. And uh, this was in July before I was starting my freshman year. And uh, they weren't sure I'd ever walk again. Um, and then four months later, my dad uh, died. And so it was a matter of, okay, you, you either, you either run to the light or you run away from the light when that happens. And to me, it was the first time that my faith had been completely crushed. Uh, dream was gone. The hero I had was gone. And I had no, I mean, the whole world was black. I'd gone through physical therapy to the point that I could walk at that point, but not very well. And not for long distances and the school bus that I rode, coming back from high school, went right by the cemetery my, where my dad was, was buried. So somewhere around the 8th or 9th of January, the school bus is going by. It's a freezing cold day, sun's out. Um, and I got off the bus and I walked into the cemetery to find his grave. And it was maybe about a mile and a half walk. Um, and at that point, I wasn't walking a mile and a half for anything. So you're shat. I mean, you're, you're still recovering. Correct. Right. And you're hobbling to his gravesite. 
Correct. You yeah. want you want to go have a conversation with Dad? I did. Actually, I went there to die. Um, I had decided that I was just going to lay down next to his grave, and it was cold enough I'd freeze to death. Um, I was that depressed. I was there was no hope for me. There was no nothing to look forward to. And I always tell people when I'm when I'm trying to talk about suicide, I said it's always characterized as this incredibly selfish act and there's always rationalization afterwards about well my god he had a wonderful wife wonderful children a great job what well, why would you why would you ever do this and, and i can tell you in that moment that day when i absolutely was sure that this was what i wanted to i really believed there was a heaven i really believed that's where he was and i wanted to go there and i knew he'd be angry as hell when i got there but i didn't care i, I didn't want to be here but at no point when I was going through that mindset that I think about what it would do to my mom. She just lost her husband within a five day period. And now her son is going to take his life. Never thought about it. Not on the radar. None of my friends. Well, nothing. You know, just... you, hell, hell is hell on the radar. You've, you know, right. back then, as you know, suicide was like saying, I, I want, I'm going to hell. Absolutely. Uh, there's been a total 100%. flip on, on that, you know, thankfully right. that, but cause for a while there, that was the, that was the message. So you have to have that somewhere in your brain, don't you? I, I did in it, in it, but it was it was not anywhere near enough to suffice or to keep me from the pain. So it was like, I'm going to go find out because I'm not staying here. Because to me, hell was on earth, right? What I was living through right. and how much worse could this be? And, and I truly, the guy that I believed in and I, the one I was raised with was like, this is about the most kindest understanding being that you're going to run into. And I'm like, Okay, well, you got to figure this out because in the span of five months, you took away my dreams and you took away my dad. So maybe there'll be a little mercy here for me. If I got to do a little duty, I'll do a little duty, but it's better than what I'm doing okay. here. And because and, obviously when, when you get to, I think when anybody gets to that point, you're not thinking completely rational. But well, you're out of your mind. I mean, anybody, oh, yeah. any, and we know that. That's, 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 right. that's the mercy of God is that you're not in your right mind when you want to end right. your life. You're just not. Correct. You're not. You're, it takes so much because you have that whole, I mean, it's an inner instinct, that fight or flight. And to go against that and to say that you're going to you're going to take your own. It's just it's not it's not a natural thing, but it's an incredibly powerful drive. I will tell you, there isn't nothing like you said, the, the rational thought there is, is well, what about this or this? You don't you don't think about all you think about is there's one door. And if I go through that door, there's a chance then it's going to be better than what I'm standing. Yeah, the pain will so, be gone. Meanwhile, you don't realize correct. it's the, it's the devil that's telling you all this, of course. It's, but. it's just, it's, it's, yeah, it's so dark. It's, it's, it really is hard to describe. So I, I went laid down on the grave next to it and, and for sure, okay, this isn't going to take very long. I remember thinking this. And then all of a sudden for the very first time in my life, I heard my dad's voice since he was gone. And I heard him say, you need to get up. And I remember looks, looking over at the grave and thinking, okay, this is working. I'm starting to hallucinate, but this isn't going to be much longer. I'm going to be asleep, and this isn't a bad way to die. All those things. I'm only 14, but all those things are going through my mind. And then the next thing I heard was his voice again, except this time it was the same voice as if I hadn't cleaned my room or I'd been disrespectful to my mom or whatever. It was like, I said, get up and get out of there. And I sat up and I looked at that grave and I went, Oh my God, he is alive. He is someplace. And I'm like, I got to get out of here. So it took all I could because it was so cold and I hadn't done that kind of walking. Got to a payphone. My godmother was the only one in the family who drove. So I called her on the payphone and said, I got off the bus to go see dad. Can you come get me? To the day she died, to the day my mom died, I never, ever told them the story of what I really went to that cemetery and tried to do that stigma that still exists, as you said earlier in our conversation, was so much more powerful back then. If anybody had found out I had thought about killing myself, who knows, I might have locked me away. I can look back and see where God definitely, every time I got knocked to the ground, sent me angels to pick me back up. Um, I didn't sometimes recognize it at the time. I still, I always say, I love that saying, you're going to make God laugh, tell me your plan. Um, I, I, there's loads of his plan I still don't get, and there's a lot of his plan I hate. Um, but I do believe that there's a, a reason for it. And as I look back, I think that my whole view of the world was about me. And all of a sudden the view of the world got turned upside down and it was like, it's not about you. It's about how you're going to take care of your mom. You're, you're quote unquote, the man of the house. Now you're going to go out and get a job at 14 and try and 
help bring in some money because my mom only had a second grade education. We were up to our eyes in debt because we, they had just bought their first house. And um, all those things changed me. I think it made me grow up a lot faster. I think it made me more sensitive to other people. I think it, it started to draw the path of my vocation to get into the fire service. I ended up doing what I was supposed to do. I always used to tell my mom when she was, she, cause she was frustrated. I didn't go into the priesthood. Um, I used to tell her mom, I go out instead of wearing a collar, I wear a bunker coat, but I go, I do the same thing. <laughs> saving people. You're saving and people. I don't have to take the vow of celibacy. Hey. So I said, it, at least it worked <laughs> out. Okay. And my wife was the one, and I had a brother-in-law who was a fireman. She said, you should talk to him about it. So he was the one who said to me, you'd be a great fireman. He goes, you love the team concept. You love being part of that because that's what we do. We don't ever do anything individually. Every day is different. At that excitement you're looking for, he said that was part of that athletic, like we, we need to save the day because it's all part of this. Yeah. So I started taking tests. Anyways, I walked into a gym that was, there were two or 300 people in this gym. And I always went, like I dressed for like a business interview. Everybody always told me, hey, they start looking at you from the moment you walk in the door for orientation. You're already on the clock. So I have a good good presentation. Whatever. So I go walking into this gym. I'm wearing a shirt and a tie. Everybody else in there is like in a fire department t-shirt. I swear every single person in there had on some type of fire department thing except me. I stuck out <laughs> like a sore thumb. This is, this is like the entry level just to get you on the radar. Correct. The proctor, he's very clear in the beginning, very gruff, got, gets everybody quiet, says, I'm going to call your name once. If you miss your name, you're already eliminated. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm, I'm on the edge of my seat listening and listening. He gets to the K's and um, I hear him say Kenny, but it wasn't Patrick Kenny. And then the next thing, it's like Kowalski or whatever. And I shoot my hand up in here and he looks out, he goes, what? And I go, sir, you didn't call my name. He said, I didn't miss any names. What's your name? I said, Kenny. He said, I called Kenny. I go, no, sir, you didn't call my name. So, well, come on up here. So now, you know, you got to do the walk of shame through all these people, you know, and you're in your tie and you look like a goof. And um, I go up there and uh, he's holding this manila envelope. He goes, what's your name? And I said, Patrick Joseph Kenny. And he said, where the hell did I get Michael from? He goes, okay, all right, kid, here you go. Take it, go back and sit down. So I walked back and I sat down. Well, my dad's name was Michael. There was no Michael. On, there was no Michael on the envelope. There was there, there was none, and that's not the name he called. Nice. And I knew when I opened the Manila envelope, I go, "You're all dead in this room." I go because I'm going to get this job because my dad is here. <laughs> I got chills, right? I just want to let you know I got chills. That's pretty cool. I ended up. You could be. They were hiring only three out of that group, and I ended up number three. And I started in that fire protection wow. district. They're taking uh, one, basically 1% one of that, that room, correct. one to 2% correct. and you were in. Correct. You know. And I was the only one of the three that was hired that had no fire department experience at all. The first day I started, the chief stopped, the ex chief stopped by and said, Hey, are you the new kid? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, uh, what's your name? And I said, Patrick Kenny. He goes, young man, he goes, did you know in the 1800s, there was a fire chief in this department? His last name was Kenny. And I, I said, no, sir. I go, I don't even know where the bathrooms are. And, uh, he said, someday you'll be the fire chief here. You know, Randy walked away. And 10 years later, I was the fire chief of that department. <laughs> so, that's, paid, and that's pretty fast, isn't it? 10 years? You were just in the right place at the right time and got promoted way too young because I was so young. I was At that point, I was the youngest chief in our whole county ever. I was 34, yeah. 35, but way, way not ready for that. But like, it just kept coming. Let's pause right about here. Get up. A father's command from heaven and Patrick Kenny will continue to get up more encounter stories. The best, the best encounters are still to come in this episode on touched by heaven. Uh, first, Oh, we have a Patreon shout out. Thank you so much, Jane, Jane, no whiskey, Jane. No, you kind of wonder how names start, you know, no whiskey. Hmm. Uh, but anyway, thank you, Jane, for helping us out on a monthly basis through Patreon by going either here to episode 175 or go to patreon.com and search for Trapper Jack, and there you go. Thank you so much for keeping this thing rolling along here at episode 175. You do make it happen. Now more of Get Up, A Father's Command from Heaven, and Patrick Kenny here on Touched by Heaven, Everyday Encounters with God. Let me do a quick God check with you here, quick God check, because, okay, sure. you've been through all the things you've been through to this point. How are you and God doing at this moment? Really good. Uh, I had a great wife, and... And things seemed to be going along. We had child number two, then we had child number three, and 
things seemed to be going along swimmingly. All right. Um, and then we ran into a problem where it got challenged again. So I, so we had three boys, Brendan, Patrick, and Sean. Sean, our youngest of the three boys, if I was going to do a profile of which one of the three do you think will follow you in this career, he was the one. But when he was five, he was diagnosed with clinical depression. I didn't know you could have cl- clinical depression at five. I knew you could be sad or angry because, you know, you didn't get an extra scoop of ice cream. But I didn't know you could have depression. And my wife, who was the saint, um, she picked it up. And the reason she picked it up was she noticed um, he colored in only in black, never used any of the other crayons. Mental illness is a physical illness. It's not a character deficiency. It's not a choice. It's a physical illness. It's chemicals in your body that are same thing as diabetes, things that are not balanced. So now we're getting ready to go into high school and we're about to start the first day at high school day before he's going to start. And we're standing on our driveway. And he says to my wife and I, he said, uh, I-, I can't do this. So I'm figuring he's talking about high school. Yeah, it's a little rough when you're a freshman, but it'd be fine. You're going to do just fine. Don't worry about it. He said, no, you don't get it. I can't do this anymore. And again, doesn't click with me at all. But my wife said, hang on a minute, Pat. She goes, Sean, what are you talking about? He said, I don't want to live anymore. Now, at this point, he's 13 on his way. He'll be 14 in about another month. So think back to how old I was when I thought I didn't want to live anymore. So now I flip into the fire chief slash dad role. And what I do is I think, okay, I'm going to scare him. Because obviously, when we have people who tell us that when we go on EMS calls, we take them to the hospital and they get taken up to the psych ward and they're not released. So I said, Sean, you understand what I do. You know, when somebody tells me that, I can't just let that go. If you're really serious about that, we got to go to the hospital and they're going to put you in the hospital and we're not going to be able to see you because they're going to put you in this room. And he looked square me in the eye and he said, I know, let's go. And walked around the car and got in. Now, that's not in the parent's handbook. Anyway. I know, let's go. I know, let's go. Wow. Four, he's not even 14 yet. And I have to tell you, the ride home after dropping him off there, I was sick to my stomach. And I wasn't sick to my stomach as much about that he was there. I was sick to my stomach about all the years I had taken other people there and how I had judged them and how I had bought into the stigma. High school was a, was a, was a nightmare. Multiple suicide attempts in and out of different institutions. Um, he's doing research in the middle of the night trying to see is there new, a new medication that helps. So finally, we ended up taking him to Mayo Clinic. They tested him from head to toe. And at the end of the week, they said to us, they said, he's terminal. Your son has tried everything and none of them are relieving his pain. Every day when he wakes up, he doesn't make the decision to die. He makes the decision to stay because the pain is that bad. And I'm like, and there's nothing we can do for him. They're like, we just have to hope that there's something new is going to come on the horizon while he's still hanging on. Is all of the pain mental? Yeah. Yes. It's not yes. a physical pain, no. but it affects you no. physically, obviously. Correct. Right. Right. Yeah. It's a wow. physical illness that manifests itself in the pain that you go through. And they're telling you it's terminal. He's going to die at some point. He's going to choose not to stay. Correct. The longest ride home from Rochester. And I remember at one point saying to him, so how did that make you feel? And he said, they were great. They were wonderful. He goes, they believed me. They actually believed me. We got a phone call that he went missing. And it's like, well, what, what, what do you mean? What do you mean missing? And then we get a, a call from the local hospital saying, we have your son. Um, he's, he, he, we found him down. We don't know how long he was down. Um, he's on a ventilator. You need to get here as quick as you can. So we jumped in the car, raced down there, and we walked in. He's gray, ashen. He's gone. And I remember standing in the doorway, just staring and going, it happened. I could, it really happened. And the doctor said, yeah, you you might want to call your family and get them to come in. We're going to take them up to ICU and uh, you can have them come and say goodbye. Here's a DNR order. Here's an organ donation form. And I remember just looking at these things like, this can't really be happening. The anger in me now was through the roof. And I was like, okay, we need to have a talk, God, because this kid has lived a horrible life. And his mother has walked alongside him that entire time and gone through this pain. And now, now, this is what you're going to do to him? You're going to leave him on a ventilator? 
like this? Hell no. You take him. You take him now. Get him out of here. It's not fair. Next day was St. Patrick's Day. That was his favorite day. It was the biggest day in our house. It was always, we had loads of people over, always had big parties. I literally peered around the corner like a little kid would. And I looked and he was off the ventilator and his eyes were open and he was staring at me in the doorway and he smiled. He's like, he goes, Grandpa Mike, you saw Grandpa Mike? Yeah. And then he described my dad in detail. So your son just saw your dad in the afterlife. As my dad was in his prime, in his 20s, black curly hair, athletic build. And he said he had such big hands. And I remember as a little boy, the thing that struck me about impressions was when I would walk with him and he would hold my hand. It was like he engulfed my entire hand. I remember thinking he has such big hands. Sean had never seen a picture of my dad the way he described him. All he saw was pictures the year before my dad died of this heavy set, thinned, gray haired guy. But he knew it was his grandfather. Absolutely. He said, did she, did he talk to you? And he said, yeah. He said, tell Dan, I'm so sorry. I had to leave him so early. But the tears in his eyes showed it to me. And she said, did he say anything else to you? So yeah, tell Dan, I'm really proud of him. And for me, all those years from the time when he died, all the way as I got married, as I got promoted, I always thought of, I wonder if he can see this. I wonder if he knows. I wonder if he's proud of me. And here it was. And she said, did he say anything else to you? And he said, yeah. He said, Sean, it's too early. You need to go back. So it only lasted about a month. He had, he had a lot of hearing damage from being down so long. So on June the 3rd of that year, um, bought drugs and he took his life. And um, a lot of people will, will in, in that point said to us, are you, are you angry? I mean, look at, look at all you've been through. Look at all your boys have been through. Look at what your wife's been through. Are, are you angry? I'm like, uh-uh. Hey, he said, I watched him fight. Uh, just this amazing battle. Toughest guy I ever knew in my life to this day. And I said, and he never quit until he just couldn't take the pain anymore. And I said, it's no different to me than if somebody's dying of cancer and goes, I'm done. He said, he just couldn't do it anymore. I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. I, I, I can't imagine. I just, since, uh, since then, uh, have you been contacted by Sean? Yeah. And so Sean, when he came out of rehab, one of the things he wanted is like a reward um, was he wanted to get shamrock earrings. So he got these two shamrock earrings. So we buried him with one pinned on the lapel of his coat, closed it. And my wife wore the other one. She goes, I will wear it for the rest of my life. And it always used to bother her friend who was sick. Like, you know, I, I think it's wonderful you wear Sean's earring, but you know, they never match anything. So let's try and pierce another hole so you can wear matching <laughs> earrings and, and the shamrock too. When she, she died on Christmas morning. Now she was an OB-GYN nurse who actually helped deliver two of our boys. So they, so this is the, your wife's friend who has now passed friend. away. Okay. Correct. She dies on Christmas day. And Eileen said when she was there the day before, she said she was just kept looking off into space. And at one point she grabbed Eileen's hand and she kissed it. And she looked at her and said, Joanne, you've never done that before. What's that all about? And she said she looked up into that space and smiled. And Eileen said, do you see something? And she shook her head. And she said, do you see Sean? And she shook her head and kissed her hand again. And she was like, Pat, I swear. She was looking at Sean. I swear. And I go, I, it, it wouldn't surprise me. I go, that, I think that's wonderful. So now it's the day of the funeral. And she decides, okay, you know what? It was really, she really wanted to me to wear matching earrings. So I'm going to do it. I'm going to grab a pair of matching earrings. I'll take off the shamrock and I'll wear them just for her. So all of a sudden I get a call in the morning and I cannot make out what she's saying because she's so emotional on the phone. I'm like, slow down. What is the matter? She goes, did you take that earring off Sean's coat? Did you take it off his coat? And I'm going, no, why would I do that? I go, we closed the lid. It's on his lapel. She goes, no, no, it's here. I hung up the phone, I raced home I walk in. So when she got ready to get in the shower, she took the earring off. She put it on the bed. She went in and took her shower. She goes to the jewelry box to find two matching earrings. She goes in the, looks in the jewelry box and sees the shamrock. So she takes it out of the jewelry box. She doesn't remember. She put it on the bed. 
Okay. So she takes it out of the jewelry box so she can look for matching earrings. And then at some point, glances over on the bed and sees the other shamrock earring. <laughs> so now there are two shamrock earrings in the room. And that's what she's so upset about that I must have taken it off his coat. So I drive home. I walk in the door. I walk in the room. And she shows me. She goes, they're both here. I go, remember how you said Joanne was so upset you didn't have matching earrings? And then you said you, you thought that she saw him? I go, that's his hearing he wants you to have it back and that was the first time in the time since he was gone that we were like oh my god it, he is telling you so he's okay in fact he's telling you he's with her he's okay so she wore that those earrings the match ones now all the way until she was diagnosed in january of 16 on new year's eve of 2015 we went to a party um, and Eileen dropped a bottle and of course everybody, you know, got a kick out of it and said, ah, I cut her off. She's had too much, blah, 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 blah. And on the ride home, she said, I'm not drunk. And I go, I know you're not. She said, but I missed the table. I said, I know it was just an accident. That's okay. Don't worry about it. She said, no, I missed the table. So we were supposed to go do one of Sean's talks in January. Okay, fine. So we leave to go to Arizona we're out in Arizona. We land. We go out. We've never been to Scottsdale. Went out. Had a wonderful afternoon. Had a lot of fun. Came back to the hotel. I said, "You know, I'm really tired. Got to speak tomorrow. Let's just get a pizza." And I said, "Let me look up a number on the phone." I do, and I call it out to her. I said, "Can you write this number down?" And then I hear her behind me crying. And I turn around. I go, "What's the matter?" She said, "I can't write." I go, "What do you mean you can't write?" She goes, "I can't write at all." And so that night we spent most of the night literally up crying going, what is this? This is serious. We need to do something. So we went to the hospital. They did further scans and said, yeah, she has nine brain tumors. And I'm at this point now starting to have my conversations with God again and go, you're kidding me. I mean, we're not, we're going to go through this again. I can't do this again. You, why are you doing this? Her diagnosis was glioblastoma. It was terminal. It was inoperable. Our middle son was getting married in uh, November, so her fight began to make it to the wedding. Now, we're 13 days away from the wedding, and at that point, my son-in-law, I mean, my son, rather, my daughter-in-law, Abby, came by, and Pat and Abby sat with her in the living room, and then Pat finally said, Mom, do you have 13 days left in you? And she said, I didn't fight this hard and come this far to give up. You bet I got 13 days in you. That was October 31st. Next day, November 1st, which in the Catholic Church is All Saints Day. She said, I, I, I won't make the wedding. I go, what do you mean you won't make the wedding? You just told Pat and Abby last night that you're good to go. And she said, I saw Sean. I go, where did you see Sean? And she pointed to the end of the bed with this determination. I'll never forget the look on her face. And I said, how did he look? And she said, Patty looked so happy and so healthy. And I said, did he talk to you? And she said, yeah. I said, Mom, I'm coming to get you. So five days later, she lapses into a coma. And I am now pleading with her. I'm like, just go. You know, he's waiting. We know. We know there's a heaven. He's waiting for you. She fought and she fought and she fought. And at about 3 o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden, she got more peaceful. And she passed away at 343. And the hospice nurse said, time of death, 343. And I looked up and I said, what time did you say? And she said, 3.43, does that mean something? I go, how many firefighters died on 9-11? And she went, oh, my goodness. I go, she knew I'd know she was okay because of the numbers. Is that a number that everybody knows? I, I, was not, I did not know that number. I knew there most, were... most, most people who are in the medical profession, because you've, well, you know, first responders are all a pretty tight-knit group, are aware what that number is. Not everybody is, that's for sure. And unfortunately, as we're coming up on the 20-year anniversary, too many people don't know what that number is. Um, but Eileen knew I would know what that number was. But even And even in Chicago, they would know what that number was. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Wow. And it, 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 Of all the it, times it, there could, it could be, of all absolutely. the times. Absolutely. It, yeah. to me, was the sign that, hey, I got her, Dad. We're good. And she let me know I'm fine, and it's all good. You keep doing what you're doing. 
you still, I was married to a firefighter for 35 years. You keep doing what you're doing. I'm just fine. And the peace that came across me, first of all, that I knew she wasn't suffering anymore, but then knowing like, how did you do that? that typical you to fight so hard to get your way and you got it. I know they're together and I know they want me to keep doing what I'm doing because it's helped people. So the following week now, my son and my daughter-in-law are getting married. So we literally had a wake on a Monday night, we had a funeral on Tuesday, we had a rehearsal dinner on Friday, and we had the wedding on Saturday. And she made me promise, she goes, you can't be sad at the wedding. She goes, they'll all watch you. They will cue off your emotion. Promise me you won't be sad. I go, you're really going to have to help me then because I'm going to be devastated. She said, I will. And unbelievable. It was a powerful wedding. The emotion, the, even the DJ said to me, there's no, normally I can tell which side of the floor is the bride side and which side of the floor is the groom. So he goes, this is just one huge circle of energy. The day before she went into the coma, she made me promise a couple of things. One was I was going to retire, obviously. And, and she said, don't do that. Don't retire because you'll be lost. And the second one was, she said, what I want you to do is, she said, I want you to write a book. Tell me and about the it was, book. It's called? It's called Taking the Cape Off. Yeah. Is uh, there a website and all that kind of stuff too you want to mention? So there is. It's Patrick J. Kenny, K-E-N-N-Y dot com. And that's got information about me speaking the book. There are some uh, blogs on there and some videos and um so if, if anybody needs something or was reaching out, that's certainly where they can go. Okay. Uh, I always like to ask uh, our guests, uh, what's our takeaway? You've got some incredible stories, great moments where you know God is there, you see his hand there. It, first of all, that there is a plan. You don't have to necessarily understand it and you don't necessarily have to like it, but there is a plan and you have to trust in it that, and do the best you can at what you've been dealt and, and fight your way through that and always feel like you, you truly are not alone, especially when you're in those darkest moments. Don't run away from your faith, run towards it because it will embody what you need to in terms of carrying on God's mission, which I think is just taking care of each other, that basic. And then, and then the second part, which is really what I try to impart to people is really you truly just have to embrace the fact that mental illness is a physical illness and you need to treat those people who are suffering through those illnesses with the same respect and the same consideration that you do for somebody who's fighting a horrific physical illness. And once we are truly able to smash that stigma, I really believe you will see the suicide rate start to dive and you will see more people seek help. And in that help, you always, I find when I talk to people who finally reach out for help, they do believe in a higher power. And usually it's something they didn't believe in before. And you need that. It's true. You can't do it on your own. Thanks, Patrick. I think we all need to kind of take a collective breath right here because uh, you've been through a lot, Pat. You you have been through so much and getting knocked down and again and again, and, and you just have been getting up again and again, obviously with the help of, I'll say dads, uh, your father and our father in heaven, God himself being our help, being our helper and helping us get back up through these these kinds of things. But you have been through an exceptional amount in in your life. And, and we're, we're all praying for you right now. Please, prayers for Patrick. Uh, did, you, did you know about 343? Did that ring a bell for you? It didn't for me, 343. But, but again, the key here is that God knows what we know. God knows what we know, and, and he utilizes that. And that's how he touches us. That's, that's the conversation. That it's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. That number was meant for Pat. Uh, as he contacts you and me as well in these non-coincidental God incident kind of ways, including like a number like 343, you know? And you, and you so have to respect Pat in his ability to see that there is a plan. He may not like it, as he put it. He may even hate some of it. But it's God's plan and surrendering to that plan. Uh, if you want to find out more about what Patrick talks about, about mental illness, and he certainly is a treasure trove of information that uh, most of us don't know or understand. His website, again, is patrickjkenny.com, and the book, of course, is Taking the Cape Off. You'll find more at his website. So thank you so much, Patrick, for your story. Now, what's your story? Let me know here at touchedbyheaven.net. 
And also thanks again for your continued help through these 175 episodes. Can't do it without you. Thanks for your Patreon help. Patreon.com, search for Trapper Jack, or just come here to episode 175. Thanks so much. See you next week here on Touched by Heaven, Everyday Encounters with God.